The first question, how do you forgive someone who continuously tries to hurt you emotionally and psychologically? How do you forgive someone um, who always try to hurt you and um, psychologically and emotionally? I guess emotionally is psychologically, psychologically is emotionally. So every time after you interact with him, you want to cry. You don't feel happy. Um, you don't want to be close uh, to that person. Um, how do you forgive someone like that? First of all, I like to, I like your, your fourth word. It says forgiveness. Forgiveness is a good term because you already know that how do you forgive someone? You know that you should forgive him or her, but you haven't done it thoroughly. You still feel emotional. You still feel psychological. If you really, really have forgiven, there shouldn't be any emotion in you because you have not done it thoroughly. Your forgiveness is conditional. Your forgiveness is conditioned on the fact that when you interact with him or her, he would not, or he or she, would not arouse you emotionally. So your forgiveness is not complete. Now, if he wants to hurt you, apart from physical uh, injury, if it's something is physical, of course, you handle it immediately in a different way. So I always, I always advise people who are working, you know, uh, anywhere, um, if you feel very unhappy on your job, it does not matter what job you're doing. There's one thing that, or if someone is really, or your supervisor or your colleague is really not fair with you and you feel extremely unhappy, there's one thing that you must not do. You don't react physically. You don't bounce back. You don't fight physically. You know why? You could be involved in a criminal Act. But you can talk at the worst, but you cannot physically. But gladly receive, you said it's emotional and psychologically. If it is only emotional, that's easy to deal with than physical. If it is physical, you really have to seek, you really have to run. So people say, if somebody is physical, what do I do? Do I stay around and argue and explain the whole situation? No. If someone is really physical, the first thing you do is run. You don't wait. If someone is really physical, he's already out of his mind. You know, you, you cannot be reasonable with him, so you have to leave. The best is to leave right away. But we're talking about something psychological. So if, you, if he hurts you by saying something, if he's not physical, how do people perform? People perform. How, how does karmic energy got created? from three modes of expression. The first one is what? Bodily behavior, action. Uh, the second one is speech. The third one is thought. If it's just a thought, it's easy to handle. He hasn't expressed that thought into volitional action. So usually what you cannot tolerate psychologically, emotionally, is the speech or behavior. How did, he talk, how did he talk to you? He talked to you by cursing, by saying something unnice, unpleasant to you. His facial expression is as if he's in a fury. He knit his eyebrows and he, you know, clenched his teeth. He expressed it emotionally. But you don't get carried away by that, as long as that is not physical. So even if someone is using speech to hurt you, you analyze that speech. That speech, how does that sentence come out. So assuming that sentence say, you're a fool, 
you are stupid. And you just get very emotional because of that word stupid. How do, how do, you, how do you resolve that? You use the method of wireless. How does that speech come out? That speech come out because of causation. On many circumstances, because of certain causes. The first one is, he's unhappy. Why is he unhappy? He's emotionally, he, the one who blames you, is emotionally imbalanced. So, what is uttered from his mouth is not the real truth. It's out of emotion. Why do you attach to a sentence that is not even a truthful sentence, that is out of emotion? Are you adding emotion to another and justifiable emotion? Here is a speech coming out from the mouth emotionally, vehemently, and uh, unreasonably. Something shut out from the mouth. A sentence, a sound. And you, being emotionally yourself, attach to that sentence. You're adding emotion on top of emotion. You analyze that sentence. This sentence, because it's emotional, he's not fit to talk at that time, he was unhappy, he could have been drunk, or he thought that you did something really bad to him, to her. So there are many causes for that speech to come out. And that causes is because of something happening in the past, or some physical reasons, some emotional reasons. They're not real. Why do you think that sentence is real? You think that sentence is so real that it pierces your heart. That sentence should not pierce into your heart. That's just a sound. And that sound would vanish in a second. And that sound is out of unreasonable ignorance. So don't create any emotion on that. Just relax and don't attach to it. Because you attach to every word. You attach to every word. You're not, even, you're not even any better than that unreasonable person because you're not sober. You're attached. Your ego attached. Everybody has this internal commentator. That internal commentator always attached and comment on things and arrive at the conditions and then emotionally attached to it. You are doing that. You are as emotional as that person who is yelling. Do you think that your forgiveness worked in that way? Your forgiveness will not work if you're adding emotion onto emotion. Okay, so your forgiveness should be unconditional. Your forgiveness should not have any attachment because that's just a sound utter from a mouth of emotional brain. So don't attach to it, just let it go. It's just like you are a mountain. If a cloud of darkness is getting by, you're not going to be carried away by that cloud. That cloud comes, let it come, and let it drift away. <clears throat> you are the mountain that is unmovable. You are that magnificent, unemotional, reasonable, rational mountain. And that cloud comes, you're not reasonable anymore. You're being carried away from by that only a cloud. And that cloud comes because of many conditions. The weather conditions, the wind conditions, and all that. Why do you attach to that cloud? Don't care, get carried away by that cloud of emotion. Just let it go. Let it go. We call it let go. And let go of your cell phone too. <coughs> <coughs> your cell phone is not letting go of you. So let it drift away. If we let it drift away, don't attach to it, non-attachment, then your forgiveness is complete. Not yet complete. You're letting it go, and you also say, I should be compassionate to this person who is yelling at me because he's ignorant, he's emotional. How, do I, how can I help him? How can I help him? You don't help him by bouncing back. Hey, you're unreasonable. I'm more reasonable. I'm more logical. And you are not right doing that. Blah, 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 blah. Are you adding firewood onto a fire? You are. Just let it cool down, let it go. Forgiveness. And try to be compassionate to the person who is blaming you. Because he really needs help. No one can do that other than you. You need to. If I use that quote-unquote word, you, you have to love him. 
you have to be sympathetic with him because he is ignorant. He does not know. Don't argue anymore. Let it go. Let it drift away. For those who understand the Chinese poem, San Feng Bun Patong, Ba Wan Ji Hui Loi. The mountain is originally unmovable. Let the clouds drift by. Don't get carried away by the clouds. Okay? So learn that complete forgiveness, that is, letting go plus compassion. That's forgiveness. It's just like for someone who suffers from depression. Someone is really depressed. And you're his friend, and you say, hey, I checked the Google and, and uh, YouTube. The reason why you're depressed is because of number one, number two, number three, number four, up to number hundred. All these reasons about people, you, know, you are depressed because the scientists, psychologists said this, 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 this. You have a hundred of these paragraphs. You don't need to do that because probably the person who is depressed is more knowledgeable than you. He's been studying about depression. He's more knowledgeable. He does not need you to, to what? To give him all this theory. He already know about it. He need your sympathy. He need your compassion. He need your company. He need you, your listening. He need you to listen to his problem. He need you to spend the time with him. He need you to, to live with him through these this, this hurdles. Not just to give him a hundred theories about this and then finally say, you are wrong. You know, you are not right. You are depressed now. You are not reasonable. You're out of your mind. You don't need to tell him that he is depressed. He already know. He needs you to spend the time with him, listen to him, walk with him, go to a cafeteria, drink over a cup of coffee, and talk about some joyous, joyful things to enliven him up. You need to have a clever way of dealing with depression. Not just repulsively talking about theory. Spend your time with him. So that if you rush everything, you can't live with uh, someone who's suffering the, the depression. I don't have time for you. You better do something about your depression. Goodbye. You think that will help? All right. Is that enough for this question? Are you satisfied now or you are not? Raise your hand if you're not satisfied. I don't have your name in here, so you don't really have to worry about it. Next question. Thank you, uh, volunteers and donors, for the uh, Dhamma lunch. What soul to you? Does the soul exist? Is the soul the same as the self? Soul is a modern English term. Soul. We call it the soul. And um, it's just a word. A word itself does not contain the actual ontology of it. You know the actual ontology? The actual nomina of it. It's just like the word fire does not give out heat. It's just a word. The, the word soul is just connotates certain meaning. And that meaning embraces a lot of explanation. In modern days, people call it soul is what's left of you when your body decay. No, no more, but you die, you die out, you don't, want, you don't have this body anymore. And then where would you go? Or where do you come from? They think of a, a concept of a, a continuation and they call it the soul. Different religions call it in a different way. You want to call it the soul? Some religion will call it the what? A liar consciousness, or tainted, or polluted consciousness. So assuming that it is something if we use a modern term, an even more modern term, we call, we call the soul a kind of consciousness. When a person dies, your, your, your body no more exists, you know, then what is your soul? Let's simplify it by saying your soul is your consciousness. And the Buddha said the consciousness is, is actually in, in eight parts. There are six parts of the consciousness that would disappear on death, that would decay, 
So your eye consciousness, your ear consciousness, your nose, your tongue, your body, would it exist anymore? No more. Because it's the case. So the first six consciousness would go when you die. And then the sixth consciousness, which if I use, let me use, let me use a company as an example. All your finance salesmen, your nose, your eyes, your ears, your body, and all that, when the, when the company is dissolved, there's no more salesmen left. How about a manager? The manager also has to leave too. When the, ma when the manager leaves, the manager is retaining a lot of files for the directors and the board of directors and the shareholders. The manager will leave and then everything will shrink into files and archive files and everything is in the cabinet. You can take information from it while you're even store in the computer. That means the keyboards will go, the monitor will go, but the memory chips are still there. All oh, this memory chip. In daily life, we have the chips to compare to, but our soul cannot be compared to material. Your soul is just all those accumulated karmic energy that you have created since this life, many, many lives before. And all this, every one of this energy, you can get away with it. If you have done something wrong, you have germinated those cars, you have unwholesome effects come out later. It depends on the maturity. So everything gets stored into, we call it a store consciousness in the Sanskrit language. In the Buddhist language, it's a liar consciousness, a storage consciousness, which store up all your past, all your present. And because you're not enlightened as yet, you will roll into samsara of life and death, it would roll into the next life. So this consciousness, which is invisible, and we call it an energy, would roll into the next life. And you may call it a soul, or you may call it a polluted consciousness. And the Buddha said, when this polluted consciousness is being purified, then that's Buddhahood. You don't have to go through that reincarnation anymore. You would, it would be a pure consciousness. It's just like a mirror. When the mirror is covered with all dust and dirt for millions of lives, if you have chosen the alternative of trying to learn how to wipe out this, this dust and dirt, assuming you want to cultivate an enlightened way, which a lot, not a lot of people would try to, in his lifetime, would try to learn the enlightenment path. Some of it will be involved in continuing to do coming energy to put dust and dirt on the mirror. Assuming this is a mirror of dust and dirt, what have you been doing on the dust and dirt? You have been accumulating all this dust and dirt yourself. And some people have chosen, for example, in, in this lifetime, I would like to learn from the Buddha. I would like to wipe out this dust and dirt. So you are on your way to enlightenment. But some people would never do that. They would keep on accumulating dust and dirt by unwholesome karmic energy on there. Killing, lying, flattery, ignorance, greediness, jealousy, hatred. All this are dirt that you created emotionally from behavior, from speech, from thought. You add on to it. And in this lifetime, assuming that you have the causes for, for, for contacting Buddhism, you have learned to wipe them. That's what you're doing now, wipe them. But it takes more than one lifetime. So you continue to wipe them until it's all one mirror, no more dust and dirt. That's what we call, to use this example, as the what? The pure soul. When it says light, dust and dirt, that is the tainted, polluted soul. The polluted soul will continue to reincarnate and suffer. That's the reason why we suffer from aging, sickness, you know, suffering, all kinds of sufferings, lamentations, sorrow, wars, killings, lying, you name them. You're adding dust and dust, dust on your mirror. But if we look at it from another perspective, that soul, with dust and dirt on it, the mirror of dust and dirt on it, the Buddha said, it contains the Buddhahood in you. That Buddhahood is in you. It has never gone away. Just as that mirror, even though it's covered with dust and dirt, still has that reflectability. Even the dust and dirt is on the mirror. The mirror has never lost its reflectability. It's just being covered up. That reflectability 
is the original Buddha nature. So you already have that in you. You have that God in you. You have that purity in you. It's just being covered. So you have that soul in you. Does that soul exist? Yet it exists. Is the soul the same as the self? When the soul is polluted, it's the same as your egoistic self. But if that soul is all bright and enlightened, no more attachment, no more ego, there's no more self. Our problems come from self. We always identify everything with that self, that egoistic self in us. Everybody has that egoistic internal commentator in you. You like to comment on everything. You like to keep your opinion on everything. And that opinion is tainted. This is a bad guy. This is a good guy. I hate him. I love him. I want to, I do, this, I want to do that. It's all egoistic. You, don't, you may not realize it until you start to, to learn, to accumulate the wisdom. So don't waste your lifetime in pursuit of material anymore. Go into the spiritual path to find out how do you get rid of the dust and dirt? Why, do I, why, am, why, am, why am I unhappy all the time? Why do I have to go through sufferings, sorrow, lamentation, physical suppression, wars, societal problems, family problems, personal problems, emotional problems? Why do I have to go through all these? Because this dust and dirt accumulated will produce karmic energy to induce you into the suffering. Not God. God will not give you suffering if that is a God. The God is in you already. That reflectability is in you. Why are you still looking for God? Don't look externally for God. It's not logical. If there is an external omnipresent, omnipotent God, you, He would have saved you already. Why do you have to go through this suffering? God is respectable. God is everywhere. There are two kinds of gods, the earthen gods and that saintly God in, in, inside of you. There's the God of the tree, God of the earth, God of the river, God of the forest. I can tell you a lot of things about earthen gods, especially when you are cutting a tree down. You remember, tree has tree God in it. Don't easily cut down a tree. A tree, well, anyway, it's not this question. Okay. Oh, dear Venerable, you have been giving talks overseas many times. When will you give same talk at local? I'm talking right now. <laughs> Why are you still looking? You see, that's the problem. You have that God in you and you're looking for God. You are listening to this guy talking already. Why do you have, when, when are you going to talk? I mean, I'm talking, am I? I'm already talking. Why are you, any, any talk, any, you know, when will you give same talk? I'm talking all the time. I like to talk too. Anybody who would like to listen, I like to talk. What is it that is called enlightenment? If I'm using the same, same example, enlightenment is get rid of the dust and dirt on the mirror. The dust and dirt get into problems. Um, there were two poems in Zen uh, meditation. Of course, they were in Chinese. I have to think, I have to translate it immediately. Your body is like a Bodhi tree. Your mind is like a Bodhi mirror. Always erase it with a brush. Don't let the, the dust gather. You know what I mean? That's one poem. Always try to get rid of the dust and dirt. Your body is like a Bodhi tree. Your mind is one reflective mirror. Always try to get rid of the dust and dirt. Don't allow dust and dirt to accumulate. That's one poem. And there was a, a top Zen master and said, this poem is not enlightened. This poem is about how to be a good person. There's another poem. Your body is not a Bodhi tree. Your mind is not a reflective mirror. There's actually wireless. 
Why do you have to do anything? <laughs> do you understand what he's talking about? You don't have to do anything. It's the actual wireless of it. You know what that means? He's talking about you have that Buddha nature. Realize that Buddha nature right away. There's nothing to be eradicated. Uh, let alone adding on to it. Well, you continue to meditate and I still don't know about it right now. <laughs> I'm still searching for it. Oh, next question. Thank you for all the teaching you provide. It is a blessing. When does the soul come from? Where does the soul come from? Where does the soul come from? The soul comes from the mind. The mind comes from the soul. So where does the mind come from? If we're always thinking about what does it come from, we always say, where would it go? If you're always thinking of a beginning, then we always think there's an end. If there's a beginning, if we, where does the universe begin? If there's a beginning, then there must be an end, right? If there's an end, we don't have to do anything. It does not matter what you do. If there's an end, you don't have you exist anymore. Why do you have to do anything? There's no beginning, there's no end. Only if there is a beginning, there is an end. If there is no beginning, there's no end. So why are you looking for a beginning? The beginning is beginningless. You don't need to look for a beginning. But how about the really, really beginning? I want to, I, if I don't, now, after I, I, I'm going to tell you a story, and after this story, then I, I, I say today is over. That was a fable. And there was, one, there was one person that liked the Buddha. He was at a crossroad. And he was walking on a crossroad. There are people walking by, and all of a sudden, he was shot by an arrow from some direction. Boom, it shot into very close to his heart. Not exactly at the heart, otherwise it would be instant death. Then he got an arrow shot on into his body and he, 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 lied, he laid on the, floor, on the ground, helpless. And there's all these people who are sympathetic and look upon a group of people gathering on his dead body, on his body. And then one group of a few people say, well, this guy is hurt. Where does the arrow come from? The other guy said, no, we have to find out what is this arrow made up of? Is it made up of wood, of stone? And the third guy, is there any poison on the arrow? If there's any poison on the arrow, what, what, where does the poison come from? In the first place, how come this guy get into this crossroad? If you ask a lot of questions, this guy is already dead. <laughs> you should really rush him to the hospital first. Rush this guy to the hospital before asking what is the beginning, what is the end, what is the middle of the beginning, the middle of the end. I mean, rush him to the hospital and ask that question later. So get enlightened first. When you are enlightened, then you know. Why do you have to spend time in knowing the beginning and the end? You have enough problems to deal with in this lifetime. If that got soft, got shot into your body, the first thing is to how to pull it out and heal the wound. Not to wait until, no, 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 wait, doctor. Where does this arrow come from? I want to find out. <laughs> is it a big of wood, metal, stone? Is there any crystal onto it? How come I feel painful about it? Is there any poison? He'll be, he'll be dead but after these questions were re investigated. So don't look for a beginning and an end. You will know when you're on that spiritual nirvana level. Because don't waste time. We're all wasting time now. We are waiting for the last day. There's no exception. Anybody who don't have to die, if you don't have to die, raise your hand. Everybody has to die, right? So why do we do something before we die? You don't say, where did I come from? I don't want to, where did I come from? Where will I go after I die? And you keep on asking the same questions every day, and you don't know where to go.